Welcome everybody to the uh, first NIST Merck meetup in 2021. Of course, everyone is hoping that 2021 is a lot better year than 2020 was, uh, but 2020 did have some silver linings. Uh, and certainly one of those is the incredibly rapid development of uh, new vaccines, vaccines in particular for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, coronavirus. So uh, let me share my screen and we'll uh, get to the program. Okay, whoops. So uh, just a reminder, uh, everyone is certainly getting used to Zoom software and WebEx software, uh, given that folks are working home in the pandemic. So I don't have to go over too much here, but your audio line has been placed on mute. Now, of course, it's just to keep the background noise at a minimum. If you have a question, uh, post it in the Q&A session uh, in the Zoom software. So we, this is a meetup, so it's meant to be on the informal side. So uh, questions are certainly an important part of the whole presentation. So we strongly encourage uh, lots of questions and put them in the Q&A. Uh, we will save all the questions till the end, although you may, uh, if you're lucky, get an answer from one of the speakers uh, in the Q&A uh, session uh, while we're going, but we'll try to bring up all the important questions at the end. And then, of course, feel free to use the chat feature to communicate with the other attendees. Uh, just a reminder, NIST is the National Institute of Statistical Sciences. It's a nonprofit. Uh, National Re Research Institute that promotes research and collaboration uh, through postdocs and conferences and independent research. And we always like to try to highlight a few of their events. So first of all, I mentioned that if you go to the NIST website and look under events, you can see a whole listing of all the events that NIST is sponsoring and co-sponsoring. But I'll highlight just a few. Uh, if you're interested in COVID-19, there's been a great webinar series that's already started. It's bi-weekly, it's together with the Committee of Presidents of Social of Statistical so Societies, that's ASA, ENAR, IMS, SSC, and WNAR. And uh, I think it's all on data science and, and COVID-19. So if you're into that stuff, which you likely are if you're at this meetup, uh, it's really a great way to get lots of current and interesting information. And I'll also mention, since a lot of folks are probably interested in clinical trials who are with us today, that the 13th Annual University of Pennsylvania Conference on Statistical Issues in Clinical Trials is coming up in April, on April 12th. It's going to be virtual. It's uh, co-sponsored by NIS. A lot of great speakers, including Natalie Dean, who you're going to hear in a few minutes, but also some other of my favorites, Victor de Grotola, uh, Whaley Hay, and others. So. The topic this year is cluster randomized clinical trials, its challenges and opportunities. Uh, and then a reminder that all of the NIST Merck meetups are recorded and the slides and recording are posted at www.nist.org under the past events tab. Uh, so you can see a list of some of the other ones that are already there and give us a few days to a week to uh, get this one there after we complete it. Our agenda for today, uh, we have some really great speakers. Uh, so I think you'll really enjoy it. We have switched the order a little bit. We'll start off with Natalie Dean from the University of Florida giving us an overview on COVID-19 vaccine efficacy trials. Uh, and then Kurt Veely from Barry Consultants is uh, gonna talk about uh, interim analyses. So trust and hesitation in COVID-19 vaccine trial interim analyses, what do we know and when do we know it? And then John Hartzell from Merck is gonna talk about the statistics behind COVID-19 efficacy trials. Where do we go from here? So since we have a great program, I'd like to get right to it. So Natalie, if you uh, would like to share your screen, I'll stop sharing mine. And let me bring up your introduction here. So uh, we're very lucky to have Dr. Natalie Dean with us, who's an assistant professor uh, 
at the Department of Fire Statistics at the University of Florida, specializing in infectious disease epidemiology, epidemiology and study design. Uh, she's a principal investigator on NIH grant uh, to develop and evaluate innovative trial and observational study designs for assessing the efficacy of vaccines targeting emerging pathogens. Uh, she previously worked on the design and analysis of phase three Ebola vaccine trials in Guinea, which used a novel ring design. Uh, her current research focuses on core protocols, adaptive designs, multi-outbreak trials, and test negative designs in outbreaks. Uh, she received her PhD in biostatistics from Harvard University, and she's been a very active member of uh, communication in science uh, during the pandemic with published pieces in the Washington Post, New York Times, uh, the British Medical Journal Opinion, and uh, Boston Review and Medscape. Uh, so with that, uh, it's all yours, Natalie. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I'm really pleased to chat with everyone today. Um, my goal is to provide, to sort of set the stage and provide an overview um, of you know, what's happened, up to, um, happened to date on COVID-19 vaccine efficacy trials. So first I'll start with um, some basics uh, and just a little bit about myself too. So I've been working with the World Health Organization's R&D Blueprint Initiative since its inception after the uh, West African Ebola epidemic. And the purpose of this is, you know, the, you know uh, we recognize that there's more that we can do in advance of public health emergencies to be prepared to evaluate new uh, medical countermeasures. So vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, there's a number of different work streams involved in this, but I've been part of the group, um, the group C on developing norms and standards for clinical trial design. So, and we have some of the discussions uh, in advance about how these types of trials and studies and what evidence we need to support um, the, the use of vaccines for these types of emerging pathogens. And um, this, you know, so the expert committee has identified a number of uh, different pathogens that we've been focusing on. So this includes Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. It also included the severe coronaviruses, uh, MERS coronavirus and the original SARS coronavirus, um, as well as disease X. So recognizing that some future public health emergency could be caused by some as yet unidentified pathogens. So we need cross-cutting solutions um, for uh, when we're planning. So this resulted in a number of recommendations and, um, and we have a publication in Science Translational Medicine that goes through, um, that summarizes some of these different considerations for designing these types of studies. I wanted to flag one particular quote, which I think is, you know, really sets the tone for um, our discussions here. And so uh, that quote, the principal goal of a vaccine efficacy trial is to obtain efficacy and effectiveness data that can support broader use of the vaccine under a defined regulatory framework. And really, when we think about what the intended use here is for COVID-19 vaccines, we're talking about hundreds of millions, billions of healthy people being vaccinated. And so that sets a very high bar for the type of um, evidence that we, that we want to generate here. So the typical regulatory pathway for vaccines, investigational vaccines, goes through um, preclinical data. So you uh, need to demonstrate evidence of safety and anti-disease activity in animals, which requires a validated animal model that can replicate the, the symptoms um, of, of disease. Um, then we go through our clinical trials. So phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. I won't spend too much time on this, but they get progressively larger. We generate more safety data and phase three trials are really our largest trials where thousands or tens of thousands of participants are individually randomized and then they go about their daily lives and we follow them up and we then can compare the vaccinated group with the um, placebo group or unvaccinated group and compare their disease outcomes. Um, the, I'll talk more about the primary outcome for these trials, but usually it's a disease related primary outcome. Like can the, you know, does the, the vaccine actually prevent the disease of interest, that clinical syndrome, um, so here COVID-19. Um, and these also generate a lot of safety data. So all of these support um, decisions about regulatory approval for vaccines. So how has this pathway been modified during the pandemic? And I'm gonna go through a few of the different ways that things have been changed um, in, in order to accelerate this, this process 
So first, um, you know, the FDA allowed uh, certain vaccines to proceed into inhuman trials, um, even though, you know, so initially we didn't have a, a validated animal model. Um, so we had, you know, experience with MERS and SARS, um, but for this new, new virus, um, so the FDA considered on a case by case basis allowed some vaccines to move into inhuman trials on the basis of her prior evidence um, with prior experience with those types of vaccines. Um, so we're able to do some of these trials in parallel. So that's why sometimes we'll see animal studies sort of coming out still, still now, um, even while these clinical trials are still in process. Um, another big step, I mean, it's been the huge investment, uh, you know, upfront investment that really de-risked this whole process for the companies, so these, the government investment um, that allows these companies to start planning subsequent steps, so subsequent phases of, of vaccine uh, trials before the prior step has been fully completed. So usually there's some downtime and then there's a, a sort of a go, no-go decision um, that's based on whether we think that product, you know, how likely that product is to work. Um, and, uh, and by de-risking that, companies are able to be more aggressive um, and, and proceed um, to the next steps without as much um, downtime and not worry about that, that investment. Um, there is an accelerated review process, and we've already seen also that instead of full licensure, um, at least in the U.S., these vaccines are being um, uh, authorized using an emergency use authorization. So that's a different bar. I mean, the goal is still ultimately to proceed to a full, um, full regulatory approval, full licensure, um, but that will take more time and more evidence. And then the other key feature, you know, we you know, we're seeing a playing out right now is that um, with more investment, these companies have been able to scale up manufacturing before even receiving regulatory approval. So again, this would be a financial risk. Um, but uh, if if you go through all these trials and you ma manufactured a lot of doses, only to find that the vaccine doesn't work. Um, but the benefit here is that. Once you know, once you have that evidence in hand, if you have that evidence in hand, then um, then you have more doses available. So all of these uh, have contributed to accelerating the the pathway um, during this pandemic. Oh, and uh, sorry, one more thing. Um, and also, uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, the the follow up. So also these trials. Uh, so we have interim analyses, but then um, the the follow up for safety has also been a little shortened. So I'll talk about that more in a minute. Okay, so there are over um, 100 different vaccine candidates currently in development. They utilize a, a, a range of vaccine platforms. There's a nice summary that came out last spring um, in the New England Journal of Medicine that goes through the, the sort of the key attributes of these different platforms. And they vary, you know, in the sense how long it takes to develop them. I mean, we've seen one of the advantages of the mRNA technology, um, you know, is that it's very you know easily modifiable plug and play can be quickly developed um, but then you know we have less experience with it and so it had not been previously demonstrated to be efficacious um, then we have other vaccines that we you know technologies that we have more experience with um, but they may take a little longer to develop um, and then also uh, whether they can be implemented uh, deployed in a single dose or whether they really need a, a prime boost model so um, this is a bit old. I mean, there's, there may be some, some changes or, or updates, but, um, and here's a, here's a list of, um, you know, a non-exhaustive list of some of the different vaccines that are in development and the type of technologies um, they use. So we can see here that, you know, BioNTech, Pfizer, Moderna are using um, the, the mRNA. Um, Novavax will be, is the furthest along using um, protein subunit. We're hearing more about some of these inactivated vaccines. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the specific candidates at the end. But things have moved incredibly quickly. Uh, I, you know, uh, this is just from yesterday. The, with the um, New York Times has a coronavirus vaccine tracker. And I mean, just the sheer numbers are really impressive. And it's just really a test of, of how quickly things have moved through the pipeline is really a testament to um, a lot of hard work. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about some of the key features of these vaccine trials and how they're designed. So um, up till now, they've focused on um, adult participants, 
so including uh, high risk groups. So some trials have, you know, I think done a very good job of, of explicitly making sure that at the front end of their trial, who they're enrolling, that they make sure that there's good representation from elderly adults and people with comorbidities. And um, that reflects the fact that we want the evidence that will support the intended use of the vaccine and where we're prioritizing the vaccine for these populations, we want to make sure that there's adequate data there. And I think that will really benefit um, the companies that have really prioritized that upfront, making sure that those populations are well represented. These trials are all individually randomized um, with active vaccine uh, versus placebo. There is one vaccine, uh, one trial that uses um, uh, meningococcal, uh, meningitis vaccine. Um, but uh, in general, it's, it's a saline. These are large trials with tens of thousands of participants across many locations and countries, uh, and they're event-driven. So really the amount of data that we need depends primarily upon the number of cases we observe. So it's critical to place the trial in a location where there is active transmission. What is a successful vaccine? So vaccine efficacy is one minus a relative risk. So we have here the risk in the vaccine group versus, you know, divided by the risk in the placebo group. This can be defined a number of different ways, like as a hazard or um, a, a relative risk or a relative rate. Um, but uh, the, the general um, threshold that has been defined is that we're looking for um, 50% efficacy against disease or infection. So this is coming from some target product profiles put out by the WHO and also guidance put out by um, FDA. And so this, so it's a little, I think, you know, I don't know if there's really precedent for having a, um, a, a target cutoff for the uh, point estimate, um, but here we have a, a cutoff of, of 50%. And, um, but what's more common, you know, is we have, we have some lower bound that we want to show the vaccine works better than some lower bound. Given that you're, um, you're providing the vaccine to healthy adults, um, that risk benefit profile is very different. That null hypothesis we're evaluating is not that the vaccine is better than 0% efficacy. Um, it's, uh, you know, it could be better than 20 or 30%. So here it's 30%. So if we had a confidence interval that needs to be live fully above 30% in order to be classified as successful. And the goal here is really to um, prevent the approval of weakly effective vaccines. Uh, these have the potential to divert resources away from um, better vaccines, could lead to riskier behavior if people, you know, were not adequately communicating um, protection and then that, it, that the vaccine was only providing a low level of protection. Um, can jeopardize the evaluation of future vaccines. And we're gonna see from later speakers that it, it gets more complicated to evaluate vaccines when you're Having, um, having to make these non-inferiority or these head-to-head you know, -head comparisons as opposed to a placebo-controlled um, trial and could also um, erode public confidence in the process. Um, so I'm deep in the footnotes <laughs> of this, uh, working with some colleagues at, um, at, at WHO that we wrote this for The Lancet. So the primary endpoint for these um, these vaccines, this was left a little bit open, you know, by, by FDA and WHO, but in general, all companies have kind of aligned on the same, the same basic decision. Um, so the, the core options are, you could look the ability of the vaccine to prevent infection uh, with regardless of symptoms, to prevent um, disease. Uh, so, you know, laboratory confirmed disease, so it has to have some set of symptoms, but really of, of any severity. Um, or the ability of the vaccine to prevent severe disease only. So we're restricting just to that, um, that sort of top of our iceberg. And so there are different pros and cons. This is a slide I took from um, a colleague. And uh, so I mean, the advantage of showing that the vaccine prevents infection is that that's what's, you know, that's really relevant to when we think about population level dynamics and stemming spread. Um, it's also uh, probably the, it, well, it would be the most common, uh, common endpoint to occur um, because everything else is a subset of that. And so we think about numbers and they would be quickest to achieve. Um, but uh, it's clinical relevance is unclear. I mean, we're de definitely primarily interested in preventing um, disease. That's the public health burden of interest. Uh, and we would still want a vaccine that was able to um, 
prevent disease, even if it, you know, it did not do as, as good of a job at preventing infection. Um, the way it's measured is a bit more challenging. Um, so uh, either you need to test people with PCR almost constantly, which some trials are doing, but it is very expensive and challenging, or you can use antibody-based tests um, uh, where you look to see if there was um, seroconversion to uh, a, different, a different antibody that's not related to the antibody in the vaccine, but um, that can also lead to many false positives. So um, what most people have landed on is, is COVID of any severity. So this is more clinically relevant, um, but it's still common enough that a reasonable number of cases are expected. Although one might ask, you know, are we really concerned about our ability to prevent mild symptoms? Um, you know, when really our focus is on is on severe severe disease and hospitalization. Severe COVID is certainly the most clinically relevant, and also just in general, vaccines tend to work best at preventing severe disease, or are certainly better than um, than than milder or uh, milder disease or infection. But the real challenge here is that um, it's a relatively rare event, so it would very few cases would be expected to be observed and you need a long evaluation period. So um, how long does it take to tell if the vaccine works? So the target number of events for most of these trials is around, uh, it varies, but it's around 150 cases of PCR confirmed symptomatic disease. Um, usually you start counting that seven or 14 days after the second dose. Um, this excludes people who were infected before receiving the full vaccine. Um, and so, uh, you know, because if I'm vaccinated and I had already been infected, I could still be incubating and maybe I'll develop symptoms a day or two later. We don't want to count that against the, the vaccine. Um, so that's the, the typical per protocol analysis, uh, part of the per protocol analysis that's used for these, these vaccines. Um, so how long it takes to accrue this level of data, this number of cases depends really upon um, how much transmission is ongoing. And when we look at where things are in the U.S. and a lot of the country, um, uh, other countries, it becomes very clear why these trials have been able to generate answers so quickly. Unfortunately, we are in um, just a really bad place as a, as a country with so much active community transmission. Um, so just a comment on follow-up for safety. So this is drawn from um, a commentary from um, folks at the FDA. And the FDA guidance recommends that data from phase three studies to support an EUA include a median follow-up duration of at least two months after completion of the full vaccination regimen. So if it's a two-dose regimen, after I get my second dose, you want at least half of your trial population um, to have been followed for, for two months. And recall that an EUA is different from full licensure from that full regulatory approval. And the specifications are that the known and potential benefits of a product outweigh its known and potential risk. So clearly by not following people beyond two months, I mean, we, we just by definition cannot have long-term safety data, um, but there is, you know, there's a lot of evidence from prior experience with vaccines that adverse events considered plausibly linked to vaccination will generally, generally start within that six, six weeks after vaccine receipt. Okay, so usually, you know, so the types of side effects that people see with vaccines are usually very temporally linked um, to, to the, the timing of when you actually receive that vaccine. So this balances the need for long-term safety data with the need for a vaccine to address um, the current pandemic. Okay, so in my last few minutes, um, I will provide just a little overview of some of the, uh, the different vaccines um, and where, where they are. So, um, so the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine is an RNA, mRNA vaccine. It's now approved in 48 countries. Um, it's provided very impressive results and uh, with estimated 95% efficacy and, um, and a lot of data. So, uh, so here, you know, this is 170 events and uh, you can see that, you know, the, the way these trials were designed, that 150 events is really to, you know, it's powered for a vaccine that's at about 60% efficacy. So with a vaccine that's much, uh, much higher efficacy, we see very um, narrow, narrow uh, confidence intervals. And what's great to see is that we're seeing sort of similar performance for different age groups. So um, we're very interested in um, ensuring that the vaccine works well for the target group of old, older adults. Um, 
the Moderna vaccine it has you know pretty a very similar results. Um, so this is approved in 34 countries, and uh, you know again you know we see a very good performance of the um, the vaccinated group, and uh, and sort of um, this is looking at different subgroups and how the vaccine efficacy varies across these subgroups. And we see really generally consistent performance. Um, start to get um, a little more variability in some of when, when you start to slice and dice into different different subgroups. But overall, it's definitely um, everything looks strongly above that this 50% cutoff and certainly that 30% lower bound. The um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, this is a non-replicating viral vector vaccine, um, and they've published results in the Lancet. And um, so uh, and so what we see here, so the estimated vaccine efficacy when you combine, so this was an analysis um, of a number of different trials, but it included efficacy data from Brazil and the UK. Um, and the estimated efficacy was um, uh, around 70%, but, um, but actually there were a few different combinations that were, were studied, a few, a few different regimens, um, and also across different trials that had a slightly different um, structures. And so they did get a, a very high um, efficacy result among a subgroup of the uh, just uh, primarily younger adults, or I think only younger adults, who received sort of a half dose regimen, then followed by a, um, a full dose. Um, but also those people uh, received their vaccine doses pretty far apart, um, more than more than eight weeks apart. So there's uncertainty whether you know will this hold up and. Um, is this attributable to the half dose? Is it attributable to the longer delay? Um, and so, so there's still some uncertainty there, but it's definitely the vaccine is, is working at, you know, at, at, at above the level that was required by, um, pre-specified by FDA and, um, and uh, uh, WHO. Okay, um, the Gamalea vaccine. So we don't really have a lot of, just have uh, reports. We don't really have the um, uh, publication or a full report full details, but um, they report that they um, have high estimated vaccine efficacy based on 78 cases, and, um, and 20 of these 78 were severe and all were in the placebo group, and they are, so we're waiting for more details, and they're partnering, um, they are partnering with um, AstraZeneca to see if combining their vaccines, so these are both um, non-replicating viral vector vaccines, would increase the efficacy. Um, Novavax is expected, uh, their South African phase 2B trial is likely to reveal results within the next two weeks. Um, they have several other trials. The UK trial is fully enrolled and the US-Mexico trial is underway. Um, these are large trials. And the, um, the Janssen vaccine, this is a one dose non-replicating viral vector vaccine, expecting to see results um, by the end of uh, the month. There's also the inactivated vaccines, um, and we have less details about these, so I'm not really reporting things out. Um, but, but China has actually already vaccinated um, almost a, a million people um, with some of these, uh, these vaccines. So there's, you know, we're, we're waiting for more details there. Okay, so just to wrap up, so what's ahead? I mean, there's more phase three trial results to come, and there are questions about, you know, what, what's happening to ongoing and planned trials. Um, it's really important that there's a clear pathway for generating evidence to support full licensure and also a clear pathway for the, the vaccines that are still moving through development. Um, so I, I think I'm going to skip this and just, and just wrap up. So, um, so COVID-19 vaccine trials present um, a new paradigm for vaccine evaluation. And because of widespread community transmission, these trials have been able to really rapidly generate evidence um, it's critical that there remains a pathway for evaluating other vaccines as we want um, diverse and widely available products to meet global needs. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Natalie. That was a great overview and introduction to everything as well as a great update. I know those of us who aren't experts like you have a tough time sort of keeping up with it all. So you've kind of give us, given us a great uh, uh, level of information to start with. And I think that'll really help us uh, to digest the other presentations today. So with that, let's move to the, the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Vili, uh, Kurt Vili is a director and senior scientist at Berry Consultants. Uh, 
where he leads Berry Consultants Research Enterprise. He's a leader in clinical trial implementation of Bayesian hierarchical modeling with expertise in platform and basket trials, as well as clinical trials incorporating the use of historical information. Uh, prior to joining Berry Consultants, uh, Dr. Vieli was a faculty member at the University of Kentucky, where he won uh, many awards, including the Provost Award for Outstanding Teaching. So as you'll see, he's a great presenter. Uh, he has developed over 100 custom Bayesian adaptive tri clinical trials for clients in industry and government and academia, and serves on several data safety monitoring boards for randomized clinical trials. Uh, he's a former editor of the journal Bayesian Analysis, and he's also author of a very popular clinical trial simulation software used by multiple pharmaceutical companies called Fixed and Adaptive Clinical Trial Simulator, or FACS. And so with that, uh, Kurt, take it away. All right, let me confirm that you can hear me. Yep, loud and clear. All right, perfect. Um, so I'm gonna focus more on a few of the vaccine trials. Natalie gave a great introduction to the broad space here. Uh, one of the reasons that we're focusing on these Astra, Janssen, Moderna, Pfizer trials is these companies have all made their protocols publicly available. This has been a great resource for people. I, I applaud the companies for doing this. Um, and certainly, you know, we all want a safe and effective vaccine as quickly as possible. Um, I'm going to spend time on down into one particular aspect of the trials, which is the interim analyses, uh, which have gotten, you know, some controversy when these came out. Uh, I think those controversies have lessened given the results that we've seen have been, you know, so far Moderna and Pfizer at 95% are so far above what we might expect from, you know, a worrisome, anyway, it's, they're not borderline. So very clear results. Uh, but I do want to talk about, you know, the general discussion here. There was lots of controversy on, um, you know, are we going to get false conclusions? Do we have enough safety information? Uh, I want to spend some time on, on what we actually know, what we don't, and when. Um, and certainly there are reasonable controversies about interims on what they might do or what they might not. Um, so some details of the, the four trials here. Uh, AstraZeneca, Janssen, Moderna, Pfizer, uh, the overall sample sizes, 30 to 60,000. These are kind of flexible. Uh, all of these trials have uh, enrolled a few extras to look at subgroups and so forth. Uh, Astra's two to one, but most of them are randomized one to one. Um, we're looking to show superiority to 30%. As Natalie mentioned, the sample size or the event counts all about 150. Um, and really different final analyses, uh, some binomials on the event split, a Cox model, Poisson regression, uh, but really all of these are going to be driven by the, um, uh, the, the event counts and the event splits with some bells and whistles. Um, as Natalie was saying, uh, these trials are generating events very, very rapidly. I was involved in, in the, just the general discussions of development over the summer when we were expecting far fewer cases. Um, so you, you can imagine these were intended to potentially take a you know, large number of months over the summer. By the time October came around, which is, I, I gave another webinar on this uh, in, in October, cases were 40,000. Um, and so you can imagine, you know, how long it takes to get um, events in a couple months. At this point, we're up to 200, 300,000 a day. And these trials are generating events very, very rapidly. Um, one thing that, that's, that implies is if you're accumulating events very rapidly, um, you're not going to see this 150 number of events very quickly. And so the question is, how much safety information are you going to have um, during that time? And it really depends on what your question is. 
So if you're looking for, say, short or midterm reactions to injections, just injection site reactions, uh, do people have uh, anaphylaxis the next day or within the first you know, few minutes? Uh, is something go wrong in the first day? Um, all of this, the sample sizes is going to be in the thousands. Um, you've got lots of people who have been injected. You will have seen the first few days for all of these. So short-term reactions are going to be very well estimated from all of these trials, and they're going to be very well estimated pretty quickly. The longer-term safety is an issue, and I haven't even gotten to, into the interims yet, but just the fact that these are going to read out relatively quickly, um, long-term efficacy is really complex. Um, we if we get a finding of efficacy from an interim or the final analysis, uh, the trial's not stopped per se. Uh, certainly, we're all we are whether they were still intending on following up the subjects long term. Um, there's a very complex issue right now for crossovers. Um, so, for example, a lot of these trials are now unblinding, and people are going to different things. I have a friend who. Uh, uh, was in the Astra trial, who's a healthcare worker and switched over to uh, the Pfizer vaccine as soon as it was offered. Um, the, uh, so you know, they're, they're, this is going to be a mess and I think uh, that's gonna be touched on uh, as we go forward in this presentation. Um, certainly at the time of the EUA, this long-term follow-up is going to be limited. So it's a reasonable argument to say, uh, I'm a little worried about how much long-term we have. Um, this is one of the reasons for this two months median follow-up uh, that has occurred for many of them. As a side note, I would have preferred that they had said for X participants rather than median. Uh, I worried a little bit that this kind of punished companies that had a bigger sample size. Um, but I, I, in the grand scheme of things, this, this all seems to have come out in the wash. Um, as Natalie was talking about, disease severity, also an issue that we probably don't have a lot of information on. Um, you have 150, 165 events. Uh, as Natalie was saying, some of these are mild. Sample sizes for severe disease are going to be quite small. Uh, a lot of the results look decent for the vaccines that are coming out, but you know, really conclusive results are going to be hard. But one of the difficulties here is to get long-term follow-up, to get lots of information on severe disease, you would have had to wait months uh, in order to roll out these vaccines. So there's a very complicated public health issue that's confounded with this. So you know, now I'm gonna get into kind of the, the, the meat of what I wanted to talk about, which was these interim analyses. Um, in all of these trials, uh, efficacy could be declared prior to the maximal event count. Um, AstraZeneca, Moderna, Pfizer, they all have particular uh, values. So um, let me uh, kind of switch to this slide here. Uh, AstraZeneca had an interim at 75 in their protocol. Um, Moderna was at 53 and 106. Pfizer's plan originally was 32, 62, 92, and 120. Um, and if certain conditions were met at those interims, they would stop. Janssen's was doing a sequential probability ratio test uh, in their protocol. They're meant to read out uh, later this month, as Natalie was mentioning. Uh, I'd be personally shocked if they have any kind of interim analyses, I suspect they will have already reached that 154 events. Uh, if they haven't, I would prefer to go live with the Janssen trial population. Um, but in any case, I'm expecting that they will, they will just release results. We will see. Um, so how do they decide these numbers and what are the risks in an early declaration? And one thing I kind of want to get at in here is a lot of times this is referred to in trials as stopping a trial early. 
And that usually has bad connotations, you know, oh, I, I didn't let it do what was meant to happen. And, you know, when I talk to, I do a lot of consulting with clients and various other things. And I, I've often described it as this view that we're flying through the cl a cloud. It's all foggy. We can't see what's going on. And somehow when we design a trial, we know at 150 events, the clouds are going to part and we're suddenly going to see the right answer. And that's just not, it's not the way data accumulates. And so to get an idea in, this is a slide that's showing the kind of data pass that we might see over time. So you can see there's a number of events on the x-axis here, and there's a proportion of events in the vaccine arm on the y-axis. So a completely effective vaccine, you would expect to see nothing in the vaccine arm. You would expect it to be around zero. Um, if the vaccine were a complete dud, you would expect about 50% in the vaccine arm. If it does nothing, events should split about 50-50. Um, uh, what you're seeing here with the curves is I've imagined what would happen if we were observing, so a black is a null vaccine and null here means 30% vaccine efficacy, null for the purposes of the test. Um, so what would happen here is, you know, you can imagine 10, of, 10 events in, you know, maybe four out of 10 are in the vaccine arm, that would be 40%. Uh, a little later, maybe at 50, we're seeing 20 out of 50, we're still at 40%. By 100, maybe it's 45 out of 100, we're at 45%. And as we accumulate information, what's going to happen is all of these curves converge, the black ones that are in this 30% vaccine efficacy, they all converge to about 41, 42%. Uh, this is just the law of large numbers kicking in, early we see more variability. The green here is the sample pass that we might expect from a 60% vaccine efficacy. So these are going to end up with a lower proportion in the vaccine arm because we expect that they, um, uh, anyway, the vaccine is more effective. We're eliminating more infections in those arms. Um, the reason that we often pick 150 is if we could only look once, we're really waiting for these things to split apart. So we're waiting for there to be clear separation between the black and the green. And so what this is really saying, going back to my cloud analogy, is we're not expecting that the clouds are going to part right at 150. We're expecting if we close our eyes and let the plane fly on autopilot and we don't open them, by 150, at the time we actually do open our eyes, we expect to be out of the clouds. That's a little bit different because we don't know really when we flew out of the clouds. And so you can see there are lots of places where if we were down in this area, these are situations where we came out of the clouds early, so to speak, and I'm using that word early again. Um, but it means earlier than 150. And so this is places, these are only green vaccines. Uh, none of the black get down into this area. So we might go ahead and say we have an effective vaccine here. Um, now, again, want to emphasize there are other issues. One of the things that kind of drives me nuts about clinical trial design in general is the notion of, you know, if we've got are we only interested in efficacy or do we also need safety? And it's always a bit frustrating to go, oh, we're gonna write our test and pre-specify all of the efficacy analyses, but then we're going to just kind of, we're not gonna think about safety till all the data's in. If safety is a key part of this, it ought to be a key part of the design. So you could say, for example, I don't want these because I don't have safety. Um, but it's not reasonable to say, I don't want these because I don't think we have efficacy. Um, you could also say, I don't think we have accurately estimated efficacy precisely enough. All of those kind of things are possible. But uh, uh, when, if you're objecting to these, it would be good to have very specific 
objections. And as I've said, there are many possibilities for those, but that gives you an idea about how to actually correct that and what is the right timing. Um, similarly, if you were interested in futility, there's a lot of cases where the black curves are, um, you know, these are clearly null. So if you got a value up here, you know, there's, this isn't going to become a green curve. There are some isolated ones, but it's pretty rare. Um, I've added on a blue uh, for an 80% vaccine. I'm kind of, so this is a graph that I made in October and it was kind of interesting. This was viewed as kind of a too optimistic scenario. And obviously this would ended up being a too pessimistic scenario, but you can see again, there's separation very, very early here. So if you think you're going to have a 95% vaccine, um, then, you know, 30 to 50 is a place where you might expect separation to happen. Um, I'm gonna focus on the Pfizer details. Um, it, it just had more interims on it. So, you know, somebody who does interims for a living, this was, was fun. Um, Pfizer's had 32, 62, 92, 120 events for interims, a final analysis at 164. Um, they have in their protocol the splits that for success and futility at each of these interims. Uh, again, this was the original plan. I've got some slides in a couple minutes on what actually happened. Uh, Pfizer's uh, would make a claim of efficacy if the probability of being over 30%, basically the probability of the alternative hypothesis, uh, Bayesian posterior probability over 99.5. At the final, this is 98.6. This is a standard kind of hybrid approach where everything's uh, expressed in terms of Bayesian posterior probabilities, but this threshold is set to maintain two and a half percent type one, frequentist type one error. Um, I don't think the Bayesian frequentist is a big part here. This is really a decision problem. And the question is what data lead you to which decisions? Uh, certainly, you know, uh, lots of discussion about Bayesian things and their interpretability. Uh, but I don't think whether you're making the right choice here is gonna rely too much on whether you're a Bayesian or a frequentist in this context. Um, I've added to the graph the um, uh, where these interims would take place. So you, there was an interim at 32. And so you can see these red bars are where Pfizer would have declared uh, efficacy. Um, so 32, uh, 62, 92, 120, and 164. And you can see these are getting a little bit higher. And again, the goal is just to make sure we never confuse this with a black null vaccine. So we always were looking for where we see this separation, but we're trying to grab out effective results. Um, you can also see at 32, for example, um, the 60% vaccine isn't going to trip very often. The 80% vaccine has a very high probability that it will actually trip at 32 um, if they actually ran this. Um, so certainly, you know, these, these red, you know, kind of get through these keyholes and you would win the trial. This is the motivation behind them. Um, I, I was in a lot of Twitter discussions at this point. Um, you know, 32 seems really, really early, uh, and it certainly is. Um, so you need a split of 626 in order to win here versus 53-111. Um, so there are lots of things that you can say negative about the 626. Safety follow-up is a big thing. That was going to come very, very early. Um, the... You could also argue that maybe these are patients that were just after they got the vaccine. And so are there durability issues? So if immunity waned quickly, maybe this six out of 26 might not hold, um, as opposed to the 53111. Um, one thing though, that, that the notion that this might've been a false result, 
is for what it is. You know, when the 626 is observed, uh, this is the posterior distribution in red that we would see for 53111. And the black is the posterior distribution for 626. So you can see here that the black, this is actually, if you write out the CDFs, the black stochastically dominates the red. Um, probabilities are higher of any given vaccine efficacy being good. Uh, the probability the black is better than the red. So if Pfizer had come out at 626 and Moderna had come out at 53111, which they did not, um, then I would be happy to take the six out of 26, modulo all the other concerns that I just mentioned. And you know, I, I inter there are some interviews in October where I told reporters, you know, I would be waiting for the safety information, but I would not be worried about the efficacy per se in this case. Uh, I think I've talked about this um, as my slides. So let me just kind of end with a couple minutes on what actually happened. Um, after the protocol had been written, there was a lot of discussion about safety, and I'm very happy that, that FDA put on these safety requirements. Uh, Pfizer bypassed their first interim at FDA request, I believe. Uh, that's at least my read of the tea leaves and, and some comments that were said. And upon agreement with FDA, Pfizer ran the second interim, but ended up with more than 62 events. So somewhere I'm assuming Pfizer has a written plan that says what they were going to do here. Um, as it turned out, that vaccine efficacy was over 90%, and I haven't actually seen what that plan was. Uh, but I, I believe it has to have existed. So I don't think there's anything going on worrisome here. Um, when that data came out, there was a lot of discussion about should this hold? And so I also got on Twitter. It's always the nice thing about being on Twitter is everybody knows forever if you were wrong. Um, and I talked about, you know, predicting the N equal 164 from that interim, the final analysis. And so this was the posterior distribution on Pfizer's first um, uh, press release, uh, Baxald out. And this is the predictive distribution uh, Bayesian predictive distribution on where they were going to be at n equal 164. Um, and you can see that, that you know, so I, I told people I wasn't expecting this to go below 85, but really wasn't expecting it to go above 95. Um, this actually was a little bit wrong. Um, as you all know, the next results came in at 95. And one of the possibilities here is that immunity actually does increase over time. And so these early interims, you've got people closer to their vaccination and at least over the course of the study, immunity seems to be increasing. And so the later events, Pfizer actually didn't see any more uh, infections on the vaccine arm. Uh, and so this came in actually a little above that range. Uh, and of course, one of the things we're interested in long-term follow-up is at what point might this go back down again, if it ever does. Is immunity permanent? I don't think that's that's thought of, but is it is it months? Is it years? We don't know the answer to that. So that's one of the things we're going to need to learn. Uh, so let me go ahead and close here. And uh, I definitely would like to thank everybody for being here and for the invitation. Great, Kurt. Thank you for sharing that with us. And, and really, it was a lot of really fantastic information on the interim analysis part. And, and again, a lot of good updates on, on what's actually going on now. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to move to our third presentation. Uh, John Hartzell is an executive director at Merck supporting vaccine trials. Uh, besides the SARS-CoV-2, he's worked on a variety of vaccines including staphylococcus, measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, and pneumococcal conjugate. Uh, his research includes uh, work on clinical trial uh, vaccines, as well as interval sensor data and random effects in logistic regression. Uh, Dr. Hartzell earned his PhD from the University of Florida and worked under Alan Agresti there. So with that, John, uh, take it away. 
Great. Uh, Dan, can you hear me? Yep. Nice okay. Easy. Great. So we had two great presentations by uh, Natalie and Bert, and I, I'm happy to follow up. And I've been kind of monitoring the questions that have been coming through, and a number of the questions have were great questions because they spoke to exactly some of the things that I was going to talk about next. And that's really kind of where do we go from here? And we, we now um, have have two fantastic vaccines that have have achieved uh, emergency youth author authorization here in the US. Um, and we would readily expect that over the coming months that they will um, complete out their full uh, submissions for FDA review and approval. Um, and so we are now sitting in a, in a very different space, we being sponsors that may be developing these vaccines than we were you know, just a few months ago. Um, and so the questions now are, are kind of, what do we have to do now? What kind of designs do, may we have to consider? Um, you know, uh, clearly it's not the end game I and mean, we're not done. We, we still need to develop uh, more vaccines, um, you know, for many, for many reasons. I mean, obviously there's, there would be a desire to have potentially a vaccine that's, that's a single dose. We have two vaccines now that are very good, but both require two doses. So, you know, from a, from a implementation perspective, you know, having a single dose vaccine would be, would be ideal. You know, we're, we're still learning about durability of protection. So we're, we're uncertain how the durability will be of these two vaccines that are already authorized for use. Um, you know, we, we could certainly realize, um, you know, with other vaccines, maybe better durability if, if, if we see some that are lacking. You know, we'll be learning about the safety profile. We just heard um, from Bert about the, the long-term safety is still a question in these vaccines because it's of just the, the very fast timeline for which these were developed. So as we get a fuller picture of these, we will certainly start uh, understanding if there are, you um, you know any concerns in in such that maybe there are you know other vaccines that might provide um, you know, a different profiles. The storage characteristics of these vaccines are always very important, and I think one of the one of the challenges of developing these vaccines so quickly um, is that you know you really didn't the the manufacturers do not have the time to spend um, kind of fine tuning the storage characteristics or the formulations that would that would allow for um, more easily storing these vaccines. We, we know that um, Pfizer's vaccine is, requires uh, minus 70 degrees. Um, I mean, Moderna is at uh, kind of a more, let's say reasonable minus 20 degrees, but certainly, you know, re re refrigerator stable vaccines are always, you know, something that are looked for, especially when you're trying to um, you kind of move these vaccines around the globe into areas that do not have the facilities to, to kind of have those really deep freezer type storage facilities. Um, and then ultimately supply challenges. I mean, we're, we already know that we're releasing these vaccines and there's, you know, planned rollouts and there's, you know, been some snags with that as, as one might expect, but ultimately there's going to be a need for lots of vaccine. Um, and you know, having many options to choose from or more than more than two or so would be ideal. So these are, you know, some of the reasons why we really need to keep moving forward. Um, and we just have to now figure out, well, what's, what are these efficacy trials going to look like? So I'm going to draw on a number of discussion points that were raised during the, um, as an advisory committee meetings back in December for both Pfizer and Moderna on it. If you had the opportunity to tune into those, they were fascinating um, kind of look-ins to, to kind of that whole process of, of the advisory committee process and the evaluations that go on there. Um, specifically, Stephen Goodman had put together a, uh, a deck that talked a bit about um, you know, designs of these placebo of these trials uh, when vaccines start becoming available, and this this image here they, they kind of put put together maybe three phases that one might think about in terms of this design evolution, where you know the very first phase where there are no EUAs, um, you know, which we were living in, you know, through most of last year where the placebo controlled randomized clinical trials were, you know, that, that was the, 
the go-to design. And that's the, the gold standard and that's what the FDA was really looking for. And we're now passing into this, you know, this window of period, this period of time in which we now have emergency youth authorization. So there now are becoming vaccines available. And they, um, Steve presented some, some ideas around, you know, what might designs might be considered then. And then as we move out of, of the EUAs and we now have licensed vaccines as well, um, you know, are there designs with re, uh, revolve around say active control trials? Um, and then also there's, there's the opportunity for observational studies at some point. So we'll talk a little bit about these, uh, some of these uh, designs that are available. Uh, I'll just note that in that discussion, the primary reason I think they were talking about it was the, Pfizer and Moderna both had decisions to make about the, the ongoing trials that they were running. Um, clearly, there was a desire, I believe, from the FDA and, and others to, to continue those trials blinded um, and continue to um, have a placebo arm to continue to allow for, for safety assessment. Um, very challenging um, and tough calls on what to do there, both from both companies. Um, you know, recently earlier this year, you know, they both kind of announced their plans to vaccinate their placebo volunteers um, and, you know, in those trials. So obviously the gold standard are these, are the blinded placebo controlled trials and provides the most reliable and our most unbiased information. Um, clearly operate, operationally challenging once, our, once vaccines become available. And there is the big question about um, ethics and I'm not an ethicist, but uh, I will talk a little bit about what was presented during the ACM meetings. Um, and you know, one of the slides that was put up there was really about the, the risks around COVID and the arguments of, of the level of risk you know, in comparison to other areas in which we still do placebo controlled trials. Um, and, and also the ability for individuals that are, um, you know, to kind of manage somewhat their own risks by taking, you know, appropriate measures, being at social distancing or masking and those sort of things. Um, and, and ultimately, the, uh, you know, a, one potential way of, of looking at this is that, you know, well, placebo controlled vaccine trials are ethically permissible. Um, they may not be feasible, but they're, you know, shouldn't be ter termed, say, unethical. And, and, and in this presentation, they talked about these no bright lines where you're not making these very strong kind of, you know, statements that are, are um, hard to argue around. So they were trying to take a more measured look at this and really assess the, the, the idea of what is ethical and what is not. We, you know, kind of regardless of that, it, 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 the sponsors will be left with very challenging um, and difficult decisions if, if one were to try to um, do such trials. And, and it, I think in that way, that's why there was a suggestion of doing something kind of more, um, you know, a, a more, um, I'm sorry, it's something to, that we could do that is not a full, uh, say, double blind placebo trial, but it, uh, it still would provide us some information. And the proposal, which was, um, uh, put together by Fulman at all, and it's actually um, you know in, online if you can if you want to look up the paper was this idea of a delayed vaccination trial. Um, so it, the idea is that you pre-plan in this blinded randomized super controlled trial a crossover time in which um, the individuals would cross over, still blinded, and receive um, either you know. Uh, vaccine if you were in the placebo arm or a placebo injection in the vaccine arm and then continue to fall, follow the individual. So at that point, all participants have been vaccinated um, and there's been just a period of time, period one in this figure of which there was true placebo control. And then you are allowed then to um, you know, follow the remaining period where you can assess um, at least through the authors have, have identified some things that you can continue to assess in this manner. So it is a compromise um, from doing a fully blinded trial and also more controlled than just deciding you're going to vaccinate, um, kind of turn the trial into open label and vaccinate everybody that hadn't been vaccinated before and follow. 
So some of the points that were raised as to you know, what you can get out of this trial, you, know, you can continue assessments of durability during that, that period following the crossover. Uh, talked about you know, potentially assessing weaning efficacy, enhanced disease, and even collecting long-term safety, albeit without a placebo control during that long-term safety, but still you know, following participants longer to assess uh, safety endpoints. You know, they identify in, the, in this paper that you know, the, ideally a longer pre-crossover period is, is what would be um, more ideal because it gives you a better estimate of efficacy and then also be able to assess the efficacy in the post period for um, drop in, in efficacy or waning efficacy. Um, really the key here in this design is that we treat participants from both groups the same by keeping them blinded and vaccinating such that, you know, if you weren't blinded, you know, maybe you'd have, participants would have different views or different behavior changes um, once they know they got the vaccine. Um, and potentially the assessment of symptoms um, could be more difficult if, if you know the, the vaccination status and you may or you may um, bring in your own biases uh, when assessing those symptoms. So this was, you know, this is a compromise from the gold standard. It, it allows for, you know, durability and safety assessments and uh, even assessments of correlative protection uh, from after the blinded crossover. But clearly it still carries some potential ethical considerations. You know, if you will be, some of the participants will be at least during a period of time unvaccinated. Um, and so the risk of, clearly the risk of becoming uh, a case during that time and potentially having severe disease is, is uh, possible. Also, you know, operationally challenging, you know, just as our other designs because of, you know, availability of other vaccines and maybe participants would just rather just go get another vaccine. So enrolling these trials could be a challenge. So the, the other space in which we could consider it, that we would, might land in is active controlled trials. And I'm gonna talk a bit about this idea of a non-inferiority active control. In fact, back in June, when the FDA put their guidance out, they made a few statements related to this, specifically around if you know safe and effective vaccines became available, where it was no longer um, they use the word ethical to to do placebo controlled, then we would uh, a design should look at evaluating efficacy with respect to non inferiority, and they even put in you know. Uh, what would be the non-inferiority margin for this sort of trial? And they, they reported minus 10%. Now, I think we have to understand one is that this was at a time when no one knew what kind of vaccines would be created, the, you know, how good those vaccines would be. But um, this was currently in their guidance. And I mean, I would expect that we're gonna see maybe updated guidances at some point, but this is what currently stands. So let's just, talk a little bit about what this means. Um, you know, Natalie already went over kind of the statistical criteria for the placebo controlled efficacy trials that have already been going on. And that's the 30% lower bound as well as a point estimate at least 50%. And if we take the, the FDA guidance, basically, you know, the hypothesis now is the vaccine efficacy relative to the active control um, is the null hypothesis being less than or equal to minus 10%. So now the lower bound for this vaccine efficacy relative to an active control has to be above minus 10%. So it is a little bit at times a little bit hard to think about vaccine efficacy relative to an active control when we've already so for the longest time been talking about vaccine efficacy relative to placebo. So let's I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the implication. So clearly if you have 0% efficacy relative to the active control, that implies that your test vaccines efficacy relative to placebo uh, should be the same as that for the control vaccine. Um, and we'll talk about you know, what does that mean if now we allow that margin to be less than zero. So, Here's a table I just put together and I have a row highlighted um, and I'll just talk through this table. So, you know, on the columns to the right, we have what the control vaccine efficacy relative to placebo is. So these are, you know, possible efficacies that, that um, vaccines may have. We know that 
uh, Moderna and Pfizer are up there at the 90% column, um, but certainly we could have efficacies of 60, 70. And on the left-hand column, this is the vaccine efficacy of our test vaccine relative to the control vaccine. So highlighted in the middle there is 0%. Uh, that implies, as we just talked about, that our test vaccine has the same relative efficacy to placebo as our control vaccine. So if, if our test vaccine is 90, then, uh, or the control vaccine is 90, then our test vaccine would be 90 as well if we had 0% efficacy relative to it. Now, let's look at what a minus 10% would represent. So that's just the non-inferiority margin that, that, was, that we just talked about. And you can see what that means in terms of a uh, reduction in efficacy relative to placebo. If we assume that our test vaccine efficacy relative to this control vaccine is minus 10%. So if we're at 55%, then a minus 10% would, would represent um, an efficacy of relative to placebo of just above 50. Whereas if you're at 90%, that 10% drop um, is just or at 89%. Um, again, I, I've extended out this table to, to other um, assumptions around your test vaccine efficacy relative to control vaccine. At minus 75%, you can still see that, at, you know, if the true um, control vaccine efficacy is 90, you know, your test, test efficacy would be um, still uh, above 80%, 82.5, versus let's say we were in the realm of a 60% uh, control vaccine efficacy. Now your test vaccine efficacy is coming in at 30%. So you can see how the underlying assumption for your control vaccine efficacy is, is clearly very important um, and also um, relative to what that non-inferiority margin is. So let's look at well, what are the total number of cases needed for these different margins, non-inferiority margins. And you know, we, we saw in, in um, the prior presentations that Roughly 150 to 160 were the number of cases that were targeted uh, for the designs that, that have been run by you know, Moderna and Pfizer. But if we look at this table, you can see, and, and based on what we saw in the previous table, that if you, are, if you need to have a minus 10% non-inferiority margin, that is a very, very tall uh, hurdle. Because um, clearly you're requiring that that the, uh, the margin is the lower bound um, for, for assessing the vaccine efficacy relative to the active control. And so you need to have a lower bound that is you know, within minus 10%. Um, and you can see from that previous table, those are some pretty tight um, uh, requirements. So here, and these are all kind of ballpark. I, I just kind of did these loosely. So, you know, you can tell by the number of zeros in this table that I was doing a lot of rounding. Um, but if you are assuming that your control vaccine uh, efficacy relative to the active vaccine is zero. So, you know, if we, we've got two really good vaccines out there, it's, you might be, um, it might be, you might be hard pressed to assume that you're going to do better than that. So you might want to assume that you're the same. But when you assume you're the same, you know, you need a lot of cases to try and get a confidence interval that's going to be bring you within minus 10% of a non for a lower bound of the um, for this non inferiority margin. Clearly, if you're willing to assume that you're like a little bit better, um, the number of cases needed uh, starts to drop down, but still, you know, you're still needing a lot of that, uh, cases to assess. Uh, a margin that is what I'd say this tight. Now, if you are willing to, to relax that margin, let's say you go down to minus 75% and you assume you're the same as this active vaccine, then you're coming in at say the 150 case mark. And, and even if you assume you're a little bit better, you know, we can see those cases drop uh, even further. I'm going to jump back just back to this previous slide to just think about that now in terms of what we see here. So we talked about how at the minus 10, it's, it's a very tight um, 
it's a it's a very um, strict requirement, and possibly more probably overly strict in the sense of if if you have vaccines that are you know really good, do you really need the follow-on vaccines to remain so so high? You know, given the assumptions that were used for the initial filings or the initial uh, placebo-controlled trials, placebo-controlled trials was a lower bound of thirty percent and a point estimate of at least fifty. These at least with high um, control vaccine efficacies, this sort of margin is, is very strict. And even if the vaccine efficacy of the control was 78 you know, or, or 80, you know, you're still having a very good efficacy uh, for this test vaccine. So you, you might you know, consider we could relax this to something here or maybe even something below this table if, if one, um, uh, you know, considers what is the true bar needed. Now, if you're if you're not confident on what this control vaccine efficacy is, well, then yes, you, you may be. If we're sitting down here, you may need to be much more um, strict on the margin um, in order to make sure that you know the efficacy of the of the test vaccine is is um, worthwhile. But again, it is a, a balance here with understanding what the control vaccine efficacy truly is, as well as uh, you know, the required margin. Now let's just, one other thing to consider now is this represents the number of cases we need, but to kind of turn that into, well, how many participants does that mean you have to enroll to observe these cases? You know, in the, in the context of an active controlled trial, you now have a control arm that has a likely very low incidence if, if we're using one of the, the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines because of just how good those vaccines are. So I just pulled the Pfizer incidence in the vaccine arm from some of the publications and it was like 3.6 cases per 1,000 person years. Um, if you were targeting the 150 cases uh, that I mentioned in the last slide, you know, roughly you're requiring about 42,000 person years. And that's under the assumption that we're just as good, you know, the, the efficacy of your test vaccine is just as good as the control. Um, there's, you know, multiple ways to, uh, to accrue those cases. We could follow everybody for one year where that would get, it, get us to it. Um, but, you know, maybe we wanna accelerate this, this um, you know, the development of these vaccines as much as we can. So, you know, maybe we, we try to do this eight, in eight months, which would increase the number of participants you would have to enroll at the beginning or even six months, um, you know, even increase it even more. So these are the uh, trade-offs one has to consider that when you have an active control in your, in your study, um, you have a very, um, it, it also is meaning that the number of cases that you need to, accru the, the accrual of the cases is going to take longer because of uh, the high efficacy in the control arm. So just kind of summarizing, you know, we've got challenges for these trials. We have the assumption around the vaccine efficacy for that active control, you know, making sure that we have that well um, understood. I think having two vaccines based on the same platform read out very closely, it's, it's almost like a confirmatory trial there. So I think we, we have a pretty good argument to understand what those efficacies are. Um, you know, what about the assumption for that active control incidence? You know, we have a we have estimates from the trials themselves, but you know, are those going to be declining now? You know, given the with vaccines getting out there, it's it's hard to know. I mean, we've seen still a lot of cases accruing or cases um, occurring right now, but you know, we, we don't know at the time when we start running these trials. And then the whole justification around the margin, um, as we said, it depends on the efficacy of the active control. You know, what about single dose versus two doses? What's that bar need to be if, if we may have a single dose vaccine? Can we, you know, something like 70% for a single dose would be just as good as, you know, having 90 for two doses. So hard questions like that. Um, just one that real quick, I wanna just mention, you know, you could also have active controlled immunogenicity trials. So if, if we are in a, get to a point where we you know, are fortunate enough to have a correlate of protection that can be identified, then we can base these trials on the imaginicity where the size of these trials are obviously much more manageable. 
but clearly identifying the COP is, is challenging, one, given the high efficacy of the current vaccines and, and limited, if, uh, limited breakthroughs to, to assess you know, what that correlate would be. It's going to require you know, joint effort of combining the data from these various studies and sponsors. And, and you know, these sponsors are working hard to bring these uh, vaccines to, uh, for approval. So you know, finding you know, the opportunity to kind of work together to, to identify a correlate of protection will, will be challenging there. And then the FDA raised this you know, in, their, in their guidance back in June. Can the COP derive from, say, one vaccine platform, say mRNA? Can how applicable would that be for other platforms? And so we'll need to uh, take that and understand, you know, if it can be really applied more broadly across these other platforms. So just kind of future of COVID trials. So I think you know, there's while there are these broad categories that can be defined as we just talked about. You know, many sponsors are going to be in development programs that are spanning these categories. Uh, studies will be running as things change with respect to availability of licenses, which is uh, licensed vaccines, which make things very difficult. Um, and so I think it's just moving forward, we're going to be really be challenged. There's going to be require a lot of flexibility in both our designs as well as the regulatory review. So Dan, I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, John. That was certainly a, a great uh set of information on, on where we're going, because obviously the landscape has changed. Uh, if I could get all my panelists back on screen, uh, we'll do my favorite part of this, which is answering questions. And there's certainly a lot of great questions from the audience, but before we get to those, I'll just ask the panelists if, uh, if you have any further comments uh, based on what you heard from the other panelists or, or questions you wanna to pose to the other panelists before we get into the participant questions. I have a question for Kurt. <laughs> oh, <yep>. Go ahead. <laughs> so, Kurt, you were talking about, um, you know, Pfizer's plan and how ultimately they didn't follow that plan, obviously. And I know there, and I had heard the same things that the FDA may have pushed them to at least drop the first interim analysis, and then ultimately they were all the way to the third interim analysis by the time they were it out. And, and you made the comment about you would expect that they have a plan there. So, you know, this was one of the things that I I was thinking about a lot is, you know, they even if they had dropped that first and they had the second, third, fourth still in play. But then when they ultimately got to the time, they blew by that second. I'm just curious, are there any implications on um, the alpha spending? I mean, they had pre-planned that that would, you know, maybe maybe they took out the first in time, but maybe they still had that second there, but ultimately they skipped it because they got to the third. Are there implications around kind of, you know, do you lose, should they have lost that? I mean, I know it's more of a purist type approach versus what happened in reality, but I'm just curious if you could comment about that. Yeah, so the it, it's interesting on what, they were blinded to results. My understanding is they hadn't even, you know, taken samples out of the freezer, so to speak. Right. So, you know, I would guess that as long as they were to pre give up any plan prior to seeing the data, I'd be okay with it. Mm -hmm. In practice, when, when this happens, what often happens is we just, in order to be conservative, we do just say, you know, you lost the alpha right. that you would have spent at that, yeah. which would equivalently, and you know, it's usually not that. So usually we advise companies just eat the alpha to make mm -hmm. sure there's no issue yeah. um, without there being, you know, a real horrible thing that you're worried about, but just to be ultra conservative. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know what they actually did, but yeah. anyway, it, it ended up being moot. I know, I know. In the in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't like that made it make it or break it. But uh, I was, it was one of those kind of technical uh, yeah. things that happened. And all the sponsors, I'm, mean, you know, Moderna too. You know, you just start blowing through these cases because the way no one knew how they would accrue. So you worry that you're not always completely blinded. You may know, you know, overall case counts, and they know anyway. They, you never know what you know. So we usually advise being conservative. Great. Any other comments or questions from the panelists? Yes, I, Natalie. I had a question. Yeah. So um, about the Dean Fullman's proposal um, with the blinded crossover, you know, I, I, in, in the end, from the population's perspective, they're all vaccinated at that point. I mean, I, I understand the motivation for the blinded part, but 
I mean, practically, does that, do we think that that's going to play a big role um, that people don't know if they're vaccinated early or late? I, I guess I, I understand it's more yeah. rigorous. Even yeah. in the absence of that, it seems like we would get similar, similar data out of that. Yeah, I, I think it's, I, I, it's all theoretical, the, 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 the potential bias that individuals might, you know, bring into play if they know, hey, I'm vaccinated, so I'm going to go and, you know, be free and do whatever I want versus, you know, maintain, we're all in a lockdown state, so I'm not certain, you know, how different people can, can be. But I think that's really from, from the purest, again, perspective, if you can keep it blinded, and there's no real challenge, it, clearly it's extra vaccinations and, and sham placebo vaccinations and things like that and bringing them in um, to do all that. But um, I think that was really the, the tenet of what they were thinking. Great. Thanks. Uh, so with that, let's get to some of the attendee questions. And, uh, you know, there really were a lot of great ones posed, so we may not be able to get to all of them. But uh, the, the first group is kind of really around measuring uh, efficacy and, and how it's done in these trials. And I think, you know, to folks who haven't looked at this, uh, I think people naturally think that what's being measured is infection rates. But as Natalie, you know, showed very nicely, it's not really that. It's there's sort of the infection rate, then there's those that have clinical symptoms, and then there's that have severe clinical symptoms. And so there were some questions around when we compare vaccines, which is certainly going to be happening with so many out there, which is the best way to compare them? Uh, is it all based, should it be based on one of those or some combination of all of those? And then along with that, in the trials, is, is there a way to actually combine those into some score that, that sort of uh, would point to which ones are the best vaccines? Uh, Natalie, let's start with you since you yeah, set sure. up and then others can comment. Yeah, yeah. So it's relevant, I, I know from the comment, it's relevant with um, Sinovac, report, although it's very preliminary, but you know we have a little bit of evidence that they, um, that, that, you know, we're seeing uh, lower S lower efficacy when you include e very mild symptomatic cases. And I mean, I think just in general, the way we should think about it is that vaccines tend to work better against, you know, more severe disease and in, in working against, in, you know, um, if you're able to prevent infection, of course, you're able to prevent disease, but there's this middle ground where you're not able to prevent infection, but you um, are able to prevent disease or even severe disease. So thinking about it as a spectrum and as we kind of group in milder or asymptomatic infections um, that will tend, that the efficacy would, would tend to, to decrease. Um, so that makes it challenging when trying to make comparisons across different vaccines. And, and really, I mean, as much as we can standardize, I mean, as at least as secondary endpoints and having standard um, definitions for certain, certain type of disease, uh, so I, I know I've seen in different protocols where they'll have, you know, case as defined by the CDC or, ca or case as defined as these symptoms. And having that data really helps us um, create a, a level set. But it, it's going to be, yeah, um, that's, it's going to be challenging. But I'd like to hear what the other folks have to say, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I know clearly the FDA and, you know, the regular agencies wanted to have a standardized definition that was used consistently. And, and even so, though, and I think, you know, as you're pointing out, Natalie, there's, you know, the way in which you collect information, the, the how often you're prompting for this information, your ability to get people to get back in and to, to quickly test. And then even, um, I mean, I think our, the assays themselves are, are fairly consistent, but there's certainly things that can be different. So, you know, even under the perfect scenario where everyone has defined symptoms in the same way and is collect, you know, from a target perspective, there are, you know, the, the devils in the, the details there and down in the weeds and, and how, you know, each case um, you know, was collected and defined. So it, it will be a challenge to just, I don't think you can just take 90 and compare it to 80 and say, wow, it's, you know, that's what it is. I think, individuals are going to have to really look deeper at how the studies were, were designed. I think the regulatory agencies are going to have to really police that. It's going to be challenging when things are on the market then. And, you know, to the layperson, just seeing numbers is probably all that's going to be taken into account as to what they might want to take versus, you know, what's better or what's worse. But, um, you know, I think the regulators are going to have to really make sure they, when they compare this, try to get it on the same level to understand 
what the two differences are. I was going to say that this uh, also, it, it, it's an issue outside of vaccines and our treatment trials, you know, is, is the endpoint at 21 days or 28 days or 14 days? Yeah. And what does it count? And what is it not? Is it an ordinal scale dichotomous? It, this standardization, everyone has their own, you know, this is the important aspect, but combining them is hard. Mm -hmm. There, there, just to add, there were some proposals for like head to head comparisons as a separate trial or something that yeah, it could even be primarily structured in order to to, uh, to look at safety. But the, you know, there have been some suggestions, and also from observational studies. I mean, I guess if they're all sort of mixing in the same population, we'll have some some comparisons. But that will have all the same challenges that those normally have. Yeah, and Dan, maybe real quick, the other element, you know, so there's there's you know symptomatic disease, which is really what everyone was targeting, and then you have severe disease. So there are, you know, one can come up with composite measures that kind of try to weight that information because certainly if we start seeing where some vaccines are limited effectiveness against severe disease and where others are better you know so that weighting of kind of in totality uh, how you compare a vaccine that that could be one approach to to do that as well yeah and that actually brings up sort of another statistical question that was brought up in the uh, from the participants which is you know I, we're using one measure which i think is essentially relative risk but uh, you know there are uh, hazard ratios and odds ratios and stuff uh, is this really the right measure or should we be really looking at a variety of you know not just different efficacy measures in terms of what counts as a positive but also in terms of the way we compare uh, you know, the placebo with, with the vaccine. Yeah, there, there are, so I mean, there are different mechanisms that we model vaccines using. There is a concept of an all or none vaccine, um, which would, the, the idea is that some, if, if the vaccine has 80% efficacy, 80% of people are perfectly protected and 20% are never protected. Um, and that's, so that corresponds to a real relative risk and that that's sort of time invariant because it's it, you've got a, some people are perfectly protected and some that are like the normal population. Um, whereas there is another structure, which is where you're thinking about the vaccine is like a reducing the hazard. And so everyone kind of has the same reduction in hazard, but as you're more and more challenged, you're, you know, you're more likely to fail. You accrue that, that exposure. Um, and so that, so that changes over time. So you need a hazard ratio. So I can't remember the ordering of how somehow they're estimated, but um, but yeah, I, I some of the I, but my my senses in general will get probably pretty similar, um, very similar estimates different ways, particularly because we're looking at a very short time period. But where we may start to see differences is if, if we're looking over very long long periods of time where there's that more accrued accrued risk. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you. I agree, so, Natalie. Yeah. So, so moving sort of a little away from the statistical, but but again, something that really affects the estimation, which, which is you know bias, and a number of people have mentioned the fact that uh, there could be a, a lot of bias in the tri trials. In particular, they were talking about the fact that, especially in placebo trials, uh, these days with the, the the availability of testing, there's the ability of folks to go get an antibody test and then see if they're in the placebo group or see if they've, you know, have more pain in their arm and therefore drop out because of the placebo group. Do you guys think that this is uh, a major issue with these trials or just a minor nuisance? Well, I mean, I'll say that it's nothing new for these trials. I think this happens in all areas, well, I would say in all areas, but in a lot of areas where people are, are trying to game the system to get, you know, onto a particular treatment. Um, I, I did see reports, similar reports where people posting on you know, social media about, you know, hey, I, I'm in the trial and I just got my shot and it hurt. I know I got the vaccine. You know, it, so it's these anecdotal, you know, stories that you see people broadcasting. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if we have a real good measure of, of how often that's occurring and you would hope that it's, it's not so... Um, impactful that it, 
turns the entire study. I, I can't imagine that we have this efficacy that we're seeing in these two trials is is because people were jumping out of the trial that were on placebo and we ultimately never saw the case, you know, that or somehow it, it, those are the people that would never have been a case. I don't know. It, it, you have to th dream up some scenarios that would make it a negative impact. I can see the bias actually going against the vaccines. Yeah, more you know, so. Oh, I, I had a fever the next day and I'm protected. I'm going to go out and party. So, you know, yeah. you, we don't know. Yeah. And, that, and I, vaccines are a little different from other interventions in just the sense that, you know, you have to show up to get your shots and you do that, but then there's not really an other adherence element. Um, and, uh, and for people who go, you know, who actually explicitly leave the trial and get another vaccine, I mean, presumably they would be collecting that information and should be, I would think they should be censored at the time they receive the other, the other vaccine. Um, but there will be a role for my like, causal inference methods in some of these, you know, different, who are these types of populations that are doing, doing X, Y, or Z. But, um, but I don't think it will change the fundamental result. Great. Uh, so, so we're kind of, while we're in this area, people have been asking a little bit about subgroups. So I know there was a question about whether there'll be trials in, in children and when pediatric things will be available. So you could speak to that. But also, you know, there's the elderly, there's, uh, you know, folks with, with uh, medical conditions. Uh, you know, in, in these sorts of trials, is there really the opportunity to look at subgroups? Or is you know 150 infections uh, just too small a number to, to to get at those things, and people just be misled if those sorts of numbers come out? I I think this depends on uh, what you're interested in. I mean, if you're interested, there's a lot of data that say next day effects of vaccines are different in older people than younger people. You know, I, I think those are pretty solid conclusions based on the sample sizes involved as the overall. When you get into the events, I think it becomes harder. And this is actually an argument also against some of the interims is if you're really interested in an older population, maybe you don't want to have an interim until you've obtained, you know, X events in each of these, each of these populations. But that is going to be hard and 150 I, I think there's a lot of subgroups we don't fully understand. Yeah. I mean, the published results so far looked pretty good. I mean, yeah. I was, you know, that was, you know, you're left kind of at, at the whim of the trial and where the cases come from. And when they presented that during the ACMs, you know, the subgroups all tracked in the right direction. So that's reassuring, I think. And these trials are not, they're still ongoing. I mean, my understanding is Moderna already has over 450 events or something, you know, I mean, they're, they're still ongoing in the midst of an active endemic. So there is um, there's a lot, or I think there's a good amount of data about um, older adults and um, it's, yeah, it's still coming in, but, uh, but particularly the trials that really did a good job of upfront, making sure there was good representation from those populations. It, like Moderna had, you know, a good amount of data on severe disease, and I think that reflects the populations that they that they included. Whereas um, the Oxford AstraZeneca, at least the um, UK trial, is it have less you know, has less data about severe disease in older adults, and I think you know that's going to be um, challenging when it goes to actually um, uh, getting the vaccine out to people and getting it. And, and that goes the, to a question uh, that was. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kurt. Oh, I was just going to say the Janssen trial actually has some explicit constraints about the amount of severe disease and so forth that they needed before they'd run their primary. Uh, and one of the questions that, that came up, and, and I think it was addressed in questions and answer, but it'd be probably good to address it to everybody is, you know, are these companies actually following up on the folks who had the vaccine, but also uh, got COVID uh, and trying to figure out, you know, how that happened? Well, I'm sure that they've collected um, samples throughout the trial where they can identify at least you know, from their imaginicity what, you know, kind of what levels they were at post-vaccination um, and have the details around each of those cases. And then I think this gets at the correlative protection idea, you know, understanding what the breakthroughs are so we can understand is there some minimal level of, of immune response that's needed in order to have protection. So I know that that, 
you know, the speed at which these guys, which Moderna and Pfizer had to put everything together and present everything at the ACM, they didn't have the imaginicity data on hand yet. And I know they said it was going to be rolling out over the next several months. So I would expect us to start seeing that. Great. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I think we've done a good job of covering sort of the efficacy aspect, but there's a lot of questions about safety. And I think the one of the biggest questions on people's mind is that these vaccines were developed so quickly, you know, has there been any compromise on safety information? And, and Natalie, you did a great job of showing sort of where they've uh, sort of made up the speed uh, or, or increased the speed. Uh, but uh, just a, a thought from you guys. I mean, where do you see the biggest, uh, I won't say compromise, but where, where are we lacking the most in terms of what sort of information we're getting from these programs compared to the much longer programs that, that you know, are usually the case or have been the case in the past? Yeah, I guess I just, you know, add that we have a lot of different systems for evaluating safety of vaccines that go beyond phase three trials. I mean, phase, um, so phase three trials can rule out a certain, certain, you know, level of rarity of an event, but we have post-licensure studies and we have the, you know, the adverse, adverse event reporting systems. And so we have all these mechanisms in place that are sort of constantly evaluating. So reminding people of all of the different data streams that, that we have that are that are assessing um, really the, the really rare uh, uh, possible event. And I guess along with that, I think Kurt, a lot of people really liked your plot showing the uh, the efficacy versus the you know different places in the in the uh, interim analyses. Um, and and folks were wondering, I mean, is there a similar plot for safety? Uh, well, there certainly would be. Uh, one issue is just safety is often very noisy, and so it's going to take longer to see, and it depends on what kind of safety event. You know, injection site reactions, you're going to have the sample size to get the splits, uh, but certainly, you know, you can, lots of trials run interim analyses on safety events as well, where there's, you know, are you above or below a tolerable threshold of safety? So yes, definitely analogous pictures. Okay. Uh, and then yeah. Moving. Oh, can I add one? So it just we are you know when when these trials cross over, so, you know, and it is going to be challenging to look at long term safety because um, there's yeah as Kurt said there's going to be a lot of noise and so it's going to be it's also going to be a communication you know challenge. Of how do we, without a placebo group, um, how do we communicate that that there are there are certain there's a background level of things that are going on in people, um, so that it is going to be a challenge. Great. And you and you saw in the you know at the ACM they were talking about a four zero split in um, I can't remember the safety endpoint. So when you even see such small occurrences of something, it, it can raise questions. So in a in a non placebo control period now where we start seeing things, we're going to have to rely on you know comparing back to background rates or or what have you to to try and um, either reassure or understand you know, the incidence of any of these things. There's also a tremendous multiplicity problem. I mean, there's a, <laughs> a 5 split, but I looked at 400 different possibilities yeah. and this is the one that was a little odd. So it, it's it's hard to detect those things. Mm -hmm. So, so you brought up multiplicity and, you know, it's, it's incredible the number of vaccines being developed. Is there a multiplicity problem there too, that there's so many being developed that some of them may end up positive just because uh, we're looking at so many vaccines? Yeah, well, yes and no. I mean, certainly you do have a multiplicity. Um, you also can see multiple ones being successful, which would indicate, I mean, Pfizer and Moderna, I think is, as Jonathan was saying, confirmed each other. Um, if you see multiple vaccines work with different mechanisms, it just indicates the body can be primed for immunity. So I think I'm relatively confident if, if we had 20 vaccines that were under investigation and one of them worked, that'd be, uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's not the situation we're in. And I think that was part of the discussion. And I know seeing some of the, and Natalie, you probably were a part of this, you know, some of the discussions around the choice of a 30% lower bound and a 50% 50 point estimate was to really 
you know, take into account that we're going to have more shots on goal here. We want to make sure we put the bars high enough that we're not just letting something through incorrectly. So I think that was some of the mindset around how they set these bars originally. Great. Uh, we're, we're just about out of time. Uh, it, it is 1245 now, but we'll, we'll go just another minute or two. And really, I'd like to just ask one last question, which is, you know, th it's been an incredible uh, path forward so quickly. Uh, and I think really a, a triumph for the pharmaceutical industry uh, to get so far so fast. Uh, in, in your thoughts, you know, what have we learned over this last year in, in this development that really is going to help us in the future? Uh, are there things that, you know, th that we've done and done better that really will improve the way vaccines are developed, not just for COVID, but, but for all vaccines? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think what I've been so impressed by has been the size of the trials and just that there's multi, I mean, some of them have over 100 sites and I just having these types of networks that can be engaged. I mean, when we think about um, so our, our, our research into evaluating vaccines for emerging infectious diseases, it's like one thing you're trying to mitigate is the risk that there's no transmission at a, at a particular site and just having this wide geographical representation um, then, then it doesn't matter kind of where transmission is occurring because you're, you're able to kind of pick it up. Um, so uh, I think, yeah, these just, just seeing how we benefited from these large um, distributed uh, uh, trials. Kurt and John, final comments? Yeah, I'll just say that I think, you know, the scientific community kind of came together in terms of kind of researching what was going on, starting back last January when this first started unfolding and then just the release of information and the sharing of information to at least to identify what are the right constructs to be looking at for these vaccines and then you know moving forward so there was certainly um, you know a lot of data sharing and information sharing that propelled this forward uh, and without that I think you know it would have been a real struggle to, to develop these vaccines. And I was just going to say, going back to your original point, I think it's just been a tremendous success story in the midst of a horrible pandemic. Great. Uh, I want to thank all three of you. I, this was really a great session. Uh, you know, this is really timely and important information for everyone. Uh, I certainly got a lot of great information, and I think the, the participants did as well. So thank you for volunteering your time and all your expertise. So, uh, you know, we don't have an audience to clap, but I want to thank all. Uh, and then also like to thank Glenn Johnson and, and Jim Rosenberger from NIS, who's done, who did all the technical parts for getting the Zoom together. And then of course, thank our attendees for their participation and their great questions. Uh, you know, that's what makes these uh, NIS Merck meetups uh, a real fun and, and informative endeavor. So uh, thanks again. Uh, we'll be coming back to you sometime later in the spring, probably April, with another meetup. Uh, until then, please uh, stay safe and uh, you know enjoy 2021, and we'll all hope it's better than 2020 was. So with that, we'll sign off. Thank you. <laughs>